Hi everyone, I'm Zach LeBeau, co-creator and CEO of Singular DTV. Welcome to the debut of our first two applications designed to empower artists and creators, Tokit and Launchpad. Tokit is our rights management application where you can tokenize your project, onboarding it to the blockchain where it can benefit from the power of decentralized computing. Our Launchpad is a project funding application designed to allow you to tap into this multi-billion dollar crypto economy and get your project made. During this launch, we'll be tokenizing short films, feature films, television, music, even a person, and much more. In the centralized legacy world, what we call the old world, business structures are known as LLCs and corporations. But in this new world of blockchain technology, Ethereum, and singular DTV, tokenized ecosystems are the new type of revolutionary business structure. Let's find out more. I remember in 1997, uh, David Bowie, he, he sold himself, he, he launched himself on Wall Street. Essentially what he did was he, he took his music that he, that he made, that he owned, and he tokenized it. Um, all of his music's future royalties, he put in the form of bonds that he called Bowie bonds. You can call them tokens as well. So the public could buy a piece of his music. It, it, was, it was a direct investment into uh, him uh, as an artist. And no one had ever done that before. It was, it was groundbreaking. And he raised uh, $55 million doing it. I remember it having a, uh, a huge impact on me, in the fact that you could take your ideas, uh, a project, you know, uh, your talent, uh, whatever you had to offer to the world, and, and go out and find a community, find an audience, find those out there uh, that, that believe in you, that support you, that want what you have to give. I wanted to do that. I, I wanted to do what David Bowie did. Uh, I wanted to tokenize my writings, uh, my, my, my books, my scripts. Um, and I was this kid from, from a small town in the Midwest and you know, I was a rebellious artist. I, I didn't know anything about Wall Street, didn't want to know anything about Wall Street. Um, and I certainly wasn't, wasn't David Bowie. But uh, you know, this, this concept, it, it stuck with me uh, all these years. And now, 19 years later, we have the tools. We're building the technology um, for anyone with an idea or, or a project to create their own tokenized ecosystem. You know, giving uh, them the opportunity to, to, to find the audience, giving the world the opportunity to uh, buy their tokens, to, to fund their project, um, to help manifest their dreams. What Singular DTV is building is a, a completely new type of industry. It's an alternative, you know, an alternative that is transparent, that is, that is uncensorable, that is peer-to-peer. Uh, where revenue collection is instantaneous, where uh, middlemen don't exist. No sales agents, no distributors, no lawyers, no intermediaries that end up diminishing an artist's profit potential through creative accounting or through waste and inefficiency. We're building a completely decentralized entertainment industry. Uh, we're building the tools uh, that empower artists that, that give them control over their property, over their revenue. And there's a movement of artists out there like Louis C.K. and Imogen Heap and Grammatic who are already leaving this old system behind. In Singular DTV, we're building this new system. In order to make sure that the most important part of the process wasn't just theory, we had to, uh, we had to prove it. You know, we had to tokenize our idea and we had to launch it to the world. And that's what we did. Our motivation has been pure and progressive and positive, open, transparent, all of that right from the beginning. Uh, it, it, it is the reason why us four founders have come together like we have and have been able to do this. It's the reason why we have been able to get the quality of advisors and, and core investors and you know, it's the reason why we're able to, to have designed what we did and are about to launch it right now. 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, launch! Singular DTV topping launches in the air! Good job, guys! So we've got 229,000 ether, 274,000 ether, 2 million, 3 million, Jesus, 4.35 million in 3 minutes, 4.48 million, 4 minutes, 5.5 million, we are less than a million away from the cap, all right, we're approaching set. We're past seven. We're at seven point one. Yes. Now let's go make some fucking movies. Yes. Yes. Thanks for all your beautiful energy and your amazing work. Yay. Wonderful. Up next, we have one of the biggest reasons we put this show together. A boundary-pushing artist, DJ, and musician, a crypto-savvy entrepreneur. He's truly one of a kind. Internationally known, he plays over 200 shows a year all over the world. I've been a big fan of his for years. And together, we're going to make history by tokenizing him and launching the Grammatic Token. The one and only Grammatic. Hey, what's up? This is Grammatic. I come from Porto Roj, which is a town on the, off the Mediterranean coast on the northern border of Italy. I uh, started doing this when I was pretty much in 7th, 8th grade. It would be hard to define my music. If I have to, there would be, I don't know, some sort of a mixture between hip-hop and electronic music and mixed with funk and soul, I guess. I just never looked at it, music making as a competition of any sort. It's, it's just art, you know. I'm not trying to compete with any other artists or anything. I'm just trying to make the music that I like, that I think it would be like worth listening to. For me to release my own music whenever I want to, you know. Like not having to deal with any middleman, anything, you know. Just release my own music and on my own terms and my own label without not having to talk to anybody about it, you know. I just want to get all that bureaucracy out of the way because it's just fucking annoying. You know? I just want to make music, so... I think that internet shouldn't be regulated and everybody's trying to so hard to pass all these bills that would make some sort of like Nazi Germany on the web where we have no rights, no freedom, co completely destroys the internet as we know it, which is totally unacceptable. It's the last free thing we have, you know. Grammatic. Man, it's so good to have you here. Nice to be here, It's man. really thanks great. For having me. First of all, I'm a big fan. And, oh, thanks. <laughs> and uh, when I discovered Bitcoin mm -hmm. and decentralization and this, this whole movement, it's, it's pretty much the exact same time that I discovered your music as well. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So I, I see it energetically going hand in hand. It's like perfect that, that now we're talking about blockchain tech, decentralized computing. Ethereum and Singular DTV. Yeah, it's actually, I was really excited when you hit me up because I was, uh, I've, ever since I found out about blockchain and Bitcoin like about four years ago, I, uh, I've been waiting for like a startup based platform to utilize this revolutionary technology for to change our industry and, and the shitty ways of it, you know, so yeah, I was really excited when you hit me up and um, and I saw the video the, the, that you guys were discussing about uh, Bowie doing the thing on on um, yeah. on Wall Street, you know, like yep. in the 80s, and it really blew my mind in a way. You know? Like I think doing that stuff 
uh, in in this in the blockchain world would be like even ne the next level of that because he gets to be with the people, you know. Absolutely. No, it's it's a good point too because yeah, okay, Bowie started this off, right? Yeah. Uh, but still, it's Wall Street. Yeah, the, only Wall Street people were able to buy in, right? Yeah. yeah. So you, well, yeah, you kind of had to be in the know, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like okay, they made this they they made this structure and everything, and they did it amongst themselves. Yeah. And the core and, idea of it was was great, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the technology wasn't there to actually do something like that and really mm -hmm. bring it out to the people. Yeah, if he was here today, I think he'd be totally down with, to do it with the blockchain. I'm yeah, pretty man. sure he'd be like, oh, you guys are doing what I wanted to do in Wall Street, but I couldn't to this extent. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Yeah, maybe he'd be sitting right here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, for Instead sure. Of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, come on, man. Um, no, but it's really great because, yeah, now it, it's just there's so much synergy mm. and synchronicity going on, and we have the tools now, and uh, you know we, we we can take it to the next level. Yeah, so. exactly. That's why I'm really excited to to be here and to to be able to be a part of it. You know. And it, you know, it's it's one of these things too where we need to show an example mm. uh, to other artists exactly, how yeah. to do it. I, th I think that. Uh, uh, if, if artists are, can usually be like weary about stuff like this, because, um, well, maybe in my world, in EDM world, they're more tech savvy than, than some other uh, musical music industry parts, you know, but uh, uh, most of the time they're like, yeah, I don't know about any of that stuff, uh, uh, and I don't think I want to be involved until I see somebody else do it successfully first, you know. Right. With me, it's always been like, yeah, I want to dive head in, and whatever happens, happens. You know, like uh, it was been like this since like peer to peer sharing, you know, and torrents and stuff. You know, so that, you know that's a great. Uh, I mean, that's a great example of of really decentralization. Yeah, BitTorrent peer to peer. Exactly. Yeah, and and that's where I mean you've been familiar with that. Yeah, for a long I, time. that's basically how I you know kind of blew up because uh, my whole thing in the beginning was. I was tied to some smaller label. I was releasing some stuff on a smaller label that were trying to do it the old school way, and I was really frustrated with that. So I just ended up leaving and putting my entire discography on Pirate Bay, and 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 you know, being like, here it is. Posted Pirate Bay links on Facebook before they were being blocked, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and people really liked that approach, and like they were like. Uh, you know, I put it, the links to my entire discography for free on my website and put oh. donate buttons for PayPal on it. So it was that that the whole thing got me started because people were like, "Holy shit, this is really generous and great of you!" And like, we want to donate now because you are not forcing us to buy your music like yeah. everybody else is doing and calling us criminals, cyber criminals and stuff like that. For me, it was like it made sense because I started out. You know, I come from a working class family and I started out making music with pirated software like everybody else they can't afford all that expensive software I, I wasn't able to get a job when i was 12 years old to pay for all the software that i needed to yeah. start making music you know everybody else is doing it so i did it and once i started gaining success i thought it would be the only right thing to do is okay my music is going to be primarily free because that's how i was getting my music too all the albums from people i was listening to you know yeah but you know the, the amazing thing about it is you know doing that Having this free model, especially yeah. after you've blown up, I mean that's that starts to curate your own kind of audience. Exactly. You know? Yeah, the people who are like-minded and think of in, in technology and the way they understand the internet of today, yeah. what it means, what it represents, how it can be utilized for people who don't come from privilege, you know. Yeah. And um, I think that that attracted all those uh, people. Who you know, those people became my fans who are like-minded in that right. way and utilize all these technologies on the internet that, that I, I found very useful and I wouldn't be here without them, without this possibility. It, it's like a fan base though more than just those who, who dig your music, man. Yeah. It's like it's like a, a the fan philosophy, yeah. philosophy, yeah. exactly. The, the, you, would have no, you, you wouldn't believe how many times I get, you know, when people donate to me, they donate not only to support the music, but they say I'm donating because I support your philosophy. Yeah, I like what you're doing. I like. I wish the entire industry was like this. Right. You know, and 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 it it means a lot to me because uh, it, they sometimes they donate more than the album would actually cost. You right. know, just because they really appreciate that they have an option. Like people tell me, you have no idea. I was there was a time in my life I was really broke. I couldn't afford anything, barely food, and and I could download your entire discography for free. <laughs> And that saved my life. And then when I got back on my feet, I, I came back and I gave you this much money to, to, as a thank you for the time that I couldn't pay for your music. You know? yeah. And that, I think, is just something that I even learned from my fans that I didn't even know it's going to be perceived that way. 
So, so you have, you know, your arts and, and your philosophy, mm. I mean, that makes a movement right there. Exactly, yeah. And, and this is what we're seeing here with, uh, w with this entire blockchain yeah, movement. This, I view this as the next level of that, as yeah. like an organized, like more implemented, uh, evolved version of that. You know? Yeah, I'm constantly being told, you know, marketing-wise, messaging-wise, to like mm. not be so technical, to not maybe talk about it as yeah, a movement, yeah. but man, I mean. It's what it is. It, it yeah. is, it is, because it's more than just, you know, uh, uh, technological advancement. It's cultural, societal, it's, 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 it's evolution, as exactly, far as yeah, I'm concerned. Yeah, it's you digital know, ev evolution, yeah. Digital evolution, I think it's evolution of the mind and spirit. Mm -hmm. um, it's it all, all goes things. together, yeah. And, and it's, it's about this, you know, and, and I, I talk about this a lot, that this, this movement, this blockchain technology, it's a mindset, man. Mm. I mean, it's like decentralized mindset. Yeah. And it, it's just amazing because where you've come from with BitTorrent and, and with your, you know, your free model and all that, that's, I mean, you're right there. Exactly, yeah. You know? That was the beginning of it where the, the, the idea of this type of decentralized culture was still being developed and they were trying different things. And I think like once you really realize what it means to, the, 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 what decentralized technology means, I don't think you can think of it in any other way anymore. Yeah. You don't, can't think of the future with technology in any other way. You, you can't undo it. Yeah, you, you can't undo it in your brain and everything else seems counterproductive. You yeah. Know? It seems like you know stepping backward into the stone. Yeah, age. exactly, exactly. Like we're trying to, to going back to a system that was in 1940s. You know, like oh, economically, what's happening right now too. You know, and politically. Yeah. It's yeah. the same thing. You know. So, so tell me, how, how did you discover? Uh, you discovered Bitcoin. Yeah. How did you discover that? Uh, I don't remember exactly how it was, but maybe I think somebody like alerted me to it on the internet. I was talking to somebody and was like, you, you know about cryptocurrencies or something like that. I can't remember precisely, but I remember it was like about four years ago and I, and I and kind of like, I was like, wait, what? Like somebody actually created a cryptocurrency decentralized and, and, and they're not dead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they haven't been killed. Well, like, we, we, don't this, yeah. we don't exactly. know. We don't know who's Satoshi Nakamoto And then is. the first thing, you know, any computer person does, I'm going to Google the shit out of this, yeah. you know? So I was going, I, you know, Googled Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency and I realized, holy shit, this was done by somebody who is who still anonymous, that nobody knows if it's a person or if it's a... Uh, a group of people, right. you know, and I was or, like, the, or the CIA, yeah, or yeah. maybe a time traveler exactly. from the future. Yeah, you know? exactly. And it just blew my mind, and yeah. all the like, all these little things in my brain started lighting up, you know, as 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 I was still a kid and an yeah. adult at the same time, seeing like science fiction based stories about this, yeah, man. and also like all the possibilities that this uh, um, means for the future, you know. So it was like, holy, sh this is this is something else. Like this is for real. At first, I thought it was a scam. You know, oh, yeah. I tried to try to figure it out. Like, yeah. try to talk to some of my friends who are way more knowledgeable about technology than I was, and they were like, no, this is for real. Like, you know, it's crazy too because it, it, it you know, Bitcoin was 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 unleashed mm. uh, in 2008, around the same time that uh, that the, the that the international crash happened. Yeah, yeah, the exactly. Economic crash. Yeah. And, and I think that was partly it's the very reason suspicious. why. Yeah, it's very yeah. suspicious. And it's like if, if somebody was within the system that didn't like the way what the system was doing, yeah. that saw it clearly what Wall Street and what the banks were doing, you know, and they were like, and, and possessed the, the necessary technological and mathematical knowledge to, yeah. to pull something like this. Amazing. And I guess maybe one day we'll find out, but we don't know. But it seems to me like there had to be a team. You know, this couldn't be one person. Like Satoshi Nakamoto has to be a group of people. You, you know, in think, my right? mind, you know, unless because if otherwise this person is the greatest genius in Seriously, right? technological genius that we've ever encountered. You know, give that person the Nobel Prize for for yeah. something. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So, so when you discovered Bitcoin, did, did did it influence your music or change your music or your methodology at all? Well, it did. Like the way I view things and the way I wanted to do things in the future. And as I said, like I was like, well, this is this sounds really promising. If somebody would fund a startup to utilize to distribute music and 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 films and any kind of art that's that's made digitally, you know, yeah. and 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 consumed digitally in in the way that would benefit everybody, you know, not just privileged people, you know, Absolutely. And people with connections, but everybody that has a voice and a talent, you know. Yeah. And I've been that's what I've been waiting for, like basically that's what changed in my mind. I've been like I hope somebody can do a startup that's actually successful and I can be part of it in some way, you know. It's great to and, have you being a part of it. Here we are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's amazing though cuz okay, Singular DTV is all about empowering artists with the ability to be their own economy. Exactly, yeah. So it's it's about 
you know, taking you, your value, what you have to give, mm -hmm. and tokenizing it. Embedded in the grammatic token is not only what your rights and your revenue and control and that, it's like your ethos, it's your philosophy. Mm -hmm. People want a part of that. It makes you into a multi-million dollar uh, tokenized ecosystem yeah. that, that you can, uh, that, that, is, that is completely uh, fueled by, by the people, by exactly, your fans. Yeah. So anytime that you want to create something, all you do is drop a few tokens in the crypto sphere, yeah. and off you go, man. You're, exactly. you're, you're on tour, you're making a movie, you're making an album, you're, you're doing what, you know, you're just creating. Exactly, and that's what's the most exciting about uh, the whole uh, um, idea, because I think deep down, even the artists who don't realize it yet, that's what you oh, want. Man, that's I'm... what you dream about, you know? Like being completely autonomous and, and, and free to, to make your art the way you want it without anybody con controlling you. And, and that, that was the reason why I started using torrents and peer-to-peer -peer and, yeah. and, and doing it myself and instead of being tied to a major label and a slave deal and doing what I don't want to do you know, in, in, in order to, so I can do what I want to do, you know? Yeah. It's just so counterproductive and it makes no yeah. sense, but that's the old system. That's the world we're living in, you know? Let's, let's set up your tokenized ecosystem, your, your grammatic token, mm -hmm. so we can launch it out to the world. Yes, let's do it. We'll launch it at the right time, and when we do, the whole world will know, and they'll be able to participate in the grammatic economy now. It's awesome. I'm really excited about it. Thanks so much for coming on, man. I'm, Thanks for having me. Let's blaze some trails. Hell yeah. All right. We have a very special guest with us today, a friend of Singular DTV, a prolific actor, the Emmy Award-winning star of the hit show Scandal, the great Joe Morton is here. Let's take a closer look at Joe. Years and years ago, I did a series called Equal Justice, and I think at that time, that was in the 90s, I think I may have been the only black actor with a lead on television. As far back as I can remember, all I ever wanted to do with my life is make a difference, have my efforts really count for something. And the Emmy for Outstanding Guest Actor in Drama Series goes to Joe Morton Scandal. You are a... Boy. I don't know how much longer I can hold this. My career is now starting. Um, not that it didn't start before, but that now, later in life, things are beginning to happen in a way I never would have suspected. We're living in a world where mobile is sort of becoming the thing. So I think a lot of production companies realize that to get great content, um, they need to put that content on mobile devices that everybody's carrying around, as opposed to having to spend 100 bucks just to go to see the movie. Those supporters, they are okay. Pleased, in fact, at the idea of a black president. There are five questions that I ask about the character. Who am I? Where am I going? Who do I expect to meet? What do I want? And to what extent am I willing to go to get what I want? Those are the questions that you ask yourself without thinking about it every single day. It's still about the work. I had to sort of always move forward on what I believed was honest and true for me. Um, that that's what was going to get me through. Like any other artist, it's your vision of what your art is that carries you through. Joe, welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Great to be here. And of course, we have uh, Kim Jackson, Singular DTV co-founder and president of entertainment with us. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Fancy. So, so you just wrapped up your season seven of Season Scandal? six. Se season six, right, okay. Season six of Scandal. Uh, and we announced at the upfronts this year that season seven will be our last season on television. Wow. What's that feel like to be involved with a television show for so long? Um, well, I've only been with it since the end of season two. So, um, one, it's great to be on a television show for that long because it means that your paycheck sort of increases from season <laughs> to season. Right. Um, two, it's also with this particular group of people, working at Shondaland is probably one of the most 
easy jobs I've ever had, mm. only because she makes it so, um, um, because the writing is so good, because m all of us in the cast are all theater actors, so we speak the same language. The writers know that, so they, so they write to that in particular. Um, it's been a great experience. You know, speaking of theater acting, it wasn't on the, uh, uh, the clip that we just played, but the most impactful performance that, uh, that, that, that I uh, um, saw you in was your performance off-Broadway last year called Turn Me Loose about uh, the activist comedian Dick Gregory. Right. And a lot of people watching this probably, you know, don't know who Dick Gregory is, and it would be a shame, uh, seriously, it'd be, it'd be a tragedy for uh, Dick Gregory's story to be lost in, in American history. Can you just tell us a little bit about Dick Gregory and why you were inspired to, to play him? Well, briefly, um, Dick would start off as a, as a comedian, as you said, and what he did was he broke the color line on television by going onto the Jack Parr show. In the 70s? In the 70s. Yeah. He actually turned down the show at first. He apparently used to watch Jack Parr all the time. And a friend of his said, oh, I hate Jack Parr. And he said, why? He said, well, because Jack Parr never allows any of the black performers to come to the show actually to sit down and have a conversation. They just come on, do their thing, and they're kind of shoot off the stage. So when Jack Parr, after Dick had sort of played the Playboy Club and gotten very famous in doing, his comedy was political. His comedy was about um, civil rights. His comedy was about the black and white situation in the 60s and 70s. Jack Parr called and said he wanted him on the television show and Dick struggled and said no he wouldn't do it and of course Jack Parr said why he said well because you don't ever talk to your black performers mm -hmm. eventually Jack Parr gave in he went on to the show and, and thereby breaking that color line and one of the questions I think that Jack Parr asked him he said well so you know um, what kind of car do you drive and he said well of course a Lincoln so that was the beginning of, of that kind of career he then met Medgar Evers Medgar Evers uh, was in Mississippi um, Medgar Evers was involved with uh, voter registration. Um, Dick Gregory went down to talk to Medgar, terrified what was going on in Mississippi. Now this is the 60s again. and um, Then very much got involved with civil rights and ultimately gave up being a comedian so he could do, be an activist 24-7. Right. The play is called Turn Me Loose because he, uh, Dick Gregory and Medgar became very, very close friends. And the last three words that Medgar spoke after being assassinated uh, was Turn Me Loose. And that show, your performance, off the hook. Well, thank I you. I mean, really. And I think you saw it in what we call backers auditions. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering what you call that. Yeah, backers yeah. auditions. Yeah, that, that meant the entire audience was made up of investors. Not exactly right. the <laughs> warmest audience one can play to. <laughs> it, but apparently they liked it enough to sort of put money into the show, which was very nice. I, I think mean, it, you thought it was the best performance that you saw. Well, like, listen, I mean, you were so Joe was, was standing like 10 feet away. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you actually came to see the actual performance when we were in the theater, yeah. but there are moments where, where yeah. I get Several the audience times. to do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I go out into the audience towards the end of the play. Um, so it, it really is um, human contact. Mm -hmm. And I was actually at the performance where Dick Gregory and his family were sitting right behind me ah. and then came up the stage because it was the first time they had ever seen it. Well, the kids had seen it. Right, but um, he had not. A lot of the kids had sort of come, I think they were kind of the uh, forward guard to sort of let him know what the show was about. Mm -hmm. uh, and he didn't come until opening night. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and my fear, which came true, was that I knew at some point during the show I would be looking directly at him. Right. Which of course happened. Uh, great story. He came the following night, yet again, with his wife. And at one point in the show I talked about the death of their child. And apparently, Dick grabbed his wife's hand, and she said, "What you holding my hand for?" She said, "That's the girl up there." <laughs> <laughs> right, because that story. I think that first night he said he had never spoken about that story right. with her. Oh wow! Well, yes, they'd yes. never talked about it, and he'd never really talked about it publicly either. Right. Yeah. Right. So it was. It was um, a very, yeah, intimate. Thing. It was beautiful. It's amazing. It's an, he's such a disruptor of, of if his time and, and still today. Well, well, that's the thing. I mean, it's all about disruption. He was a disruptor. Uh, you used his, his talent and his voice uh, for positive change. Uh, I mean, Joe, all your career, you've been a disruptor as well. Uh, I mean, I've heard stories about... Which is possible. Right. I mean, I've heard stories as a young actor where you refused roles because... Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I started acting in around 1968. So when I sort of began, a lot of the roles for black male actors in particular were either pimps or drug addicts or, or, or drug dealers or whomever, some, 
someone will get that part. It just won't be me. Right. And that what I what I really wanted to do very purposely was to try to put together, if you will, a portfolio of roles mm. um, that were simply about a number of different kind of black men, and that I wouldn't mind playing a drug addict, or if it if it made sense in in a very particular way, if right. it, not just to be there at, as a as an image, but there as some sort of story. Um, so yes, I turned down lots of roles which my agents were not very happy about for a very long time. Well, you started to control your your image, your message, who you Absolutely. are as a. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, in, in life we have um, little opportunity to control our destiny. So every opportunity that one has, I think one should take. Absolutely, because there's so many gatekeepers out there that oppress and suppress expression, and when artists do actually finally get their expression out there, there's an even more elaborate system of intermediaries who extract value and revenue from it, making it practically impossible for a, a, a good number of, of artists to make a living off of it. I mean, so. decentralization is one of those words that I think has become part of the lexicon due to places, things like um, occupying Wall Street. Everyone kept saying, well, there's no central kind of yeah. person or group that we can talk to. Right. Black Lives Matter did the same sort of thing for right. all the same reasons, so that they could actually sort of move around and do what they needed to do without, well, without having their central person being assassinated a la Martin yes. Luther King. So the same right. thing here in terms of the e economics. Yep. You don't want your economy, as it were, to be assassinated because you have all these intermediaries who sort of tell you, basically want to say no to you most of the time. You know, what we're doing is creating an entertainment economy right. for artists. So we've got to onboard them somehow, and we do that by taking their ideas, their projects, and decentralizing them, turning them into a tokenized ecosystem with their own tokens. Because it's these tokens that are programmed with all these functions and features to give you control. To give you control over your IP, your rights, your revenue, all of these things. Our focus is educating artists to, to understand this so that they can use our applications to tokenize themselves and, uh, and really understand what it is to be their own economy and have, have that freedom. So I think you need to explain, so what's the difference between this crypto economy and my putting money in the bank? I mean, or, or crypto economy and my investing in any commodity that might be out there? When you have money in a bank, uh, it's not your money, it's the bank's money. When you have uh, crypto tokens or cryptocurrency in your own wallet, it's yours. You hold it, you control it. There's really two worlds happening right now. It's the old centralized legacy world where you, know, you have money in banks and intermediaries who shuffle things around for you. And then there's this new world that we're building. I call it the decentralization paradigm uh, on Ethereum on Singular DTV. This is where you control all this. This is like the people's money as opposed to um, some bank's money or some investment company's money. Yes, and, and the interesting thing is the people decide the value of it too. The more people that want what you have to give, the, the higher the value. If you have a project right now and uh, you're wondering how to get it up and off the ground, how to get it made, and you're not wanting to deal with so many intermediaries and people that have to say yes in order for you to move forward, then you should be thinking about uh, tokenizing your project, performing a token launch, and getting into this crypto economy. And so I, I think in a lot of ways this is the change. This is a change, and it's a very positive change, and you know, not to get too revolutionary, but it is, this technology is really for people. It's for people. It, it's to be able to empower people to finally have control over very basic things, like their money, and you know, how you use it, and what you choose to, to become a patron of. Um, and so again, we happen to be applying this to entertainment. Mm. You know, we've got, um, we've got a young filmmaker with us today. Her name is Hushnura Shukarova. Uh, she uh, is from Tajikistan. And she came to the United States because as a Muslim woman in Tajikistan, she didn't feel she could uh, become a filmmaker there, mm. that she could be supported. Well, that opportunity does not exist for women there. So she came to the United States, and she's with us. She's here with us today. And we're going to uh, take one of her ideas. It's a really great idea and we're going to put it through our applications and we're going to uh, create a tokenized ecosystem around her short film, it's a short film, and then we're going to launch it so that the crypto economy can, can fund it and she can begin her, uh, her filmmaking career. Excellent. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, Hushnuda's project. Excellent. Hi, my name is Khushnuda Shkurova. I'm from Tajikistan, and I work as a filmmaker in New York now. 
For those who don't know where Tajikistan is, Tajikistan is in Central Asia. I grew up uh, during the Civil War. Uh, I was six years old at that time, and uh, I didn't know what war was, but I felt it with hunger and uh, fear. Luckily for us, the war ended, and I uh, had a chance to go to school, and I graduated from uh, high school, and I went to journalism school. I wanted to tell stories of people. I was very lucky, I got a full scholarship. So I came to the United States in 2007 to the University of Montana to pursue my dream. And this is where I got involved in documentary filmmaking when I got a documentary uh, class. Afterwards, I landed an internship at National Geographic for six months. This is when I made my transition to come to East Coast. Uh, my internship ended and I moved to New York. Here in New York, I started my school at the new school. I studied film. And uh, after my first year, I went back to Tajikistan. And there I met this uh, wonderful woman, Nadira. For four days, I was following her, documenting her life. I started cutting my documentary together. And to my surprise, a BBC producer reached out and he wanted to see my documentary and I signed a contract with them. My film was one of the successful projects so far. And during uh, three years of my working visa, which I received, I saw everything gonna change, I will be a filmmaker. But unfortunately, it did not happen because I uh, struggled as a, any filmmaker could struggle in New York. New York is a very very beautiful place to be as an independent filmmaker, but also it's very competitive because as an independent filmmaker you rely on funds and uh, there are a lot of competition around. I worked on several uh, film productions, I was a production assistant and so I worked all these jobs so I can have chance to make my own projects on my own time. I was very lucky. I met this wonderful company, Singular DTV that uh, laid out a platform for people like me who are struggling and trying to make their movies. And uh, I was very happy to come on board. My next film is called Detain, and it's about two refugee brothers coming to the United States at the time of executive orders that stopped seven major Muslim countries from entering. Uh, the film deals with uh, uh, two brothers going through the airport checkups uh, while being interrogated by the custom and border police officers. I hope everyone can relate to these two characters because I certainly do. Uh, I was myself on working visa, but I was afraid to go home. This movie is very close to me and I really want to tell this story. By supporting this film, you're supporting not only Muslim refugees, but humanity. As a filmmaker, I cannot stop the war, but I can tell the stories of people who went through war. Wow, Hushnuta, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you're, you're our, uh, our first demo artist uh, uh, for you. a short film uh, on Singular DTV. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, <laughs> she's saying that the song at the end is about Tajikistan? Yes, uh, it's a very old uh, poem, uh, a Persian poem about the uh, Turkish girl. So the poet is uh, describing how he fell in love with a Turkish girl. Ah. So I will give my... Uh, two cities that Samarkand and Bukhara, they were very famous cities in uh, Persian history. So he's kind of explaining it in the poem that uh, when I saw you, I would uh, trade these two cities to just have you. <laughs> so yeah, it's like a very famous uh, poem. So you left Tajikistan to come to the United States. Tell us a little bit about that. I always wanted to pursue um, filmmaking, but we don't have film school. 
Mm. So uh, we have only drama school and post, uh, so it's a post-Soviet country. Then after the civil war we had in 1992, 1997, uh, the uh, education system, the economy, everything went down. So in order to get the education you want, you have to look other places. So the close would be Russia and then uh, other countries. But I was lucky I got the scholarship from the University of Montana. But back home still now, there are not much opportunities for filmmakers because the art of filmmaking is kind of dying there. Mm. And there are not many people are supporting the um, films. And we were talking a little bit backstage as well. You were saying that, you know, traditionally, culturally in Tajikistan, uh, for women, um, uh, you're pushed into a certain direction at, at quite an early age. Yeah, yeah. Growing up, uh, it's a very patriarchal society, and um, it's like females are basically when you're growing up, they try to make learn like how to cook and how to be like you know housewife but they never encourage you as a female to pursue like a career like filmmaker and uh, or some uh, behind the camera and all of those things that uh, females also can do and uh, it's like I feel like it's the society also pressuring the parents um, and the parents are forced to follow the things that's going on in the society. And so uh, what did they say when they saw your short film on BBC? Uh, Persia, for BBC actually, Persia. Actually, I was a star back home. <laughs> 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 I was like, everyone was like uh, surprised. Like, and they never heard of me. And then now like uh, friends over Facebook and all other platforms, they, they heard about the movie. Uh, my parents were very happy. My dad didn't uh, tell me much, but my mom was telling me that he was going around and showing off to his friends. My <laughs> daughter's, of course he was. <laughs> yes, it's like yeah. my daughter's film is on BBC. And uh, I met um, Krishnuda a few years back, yes. and uh, she was, she just had finished that film. Yes. And um, you know, you may have come from a culture that didn't promote that but let me tell you I didn't recognize any of that sort of trait in you because she's extremely tenacious <laughs> and uh, is not shy to ask you know the questions and to find out everything she would need to know about something so it's a real pleasure to be able to work with you on Singular DTV to do your Thank next you. film. Detained, tell us a little bit about that. I came here for an educational opportunity as well and I think uh, when this happened, the executive orders were passed and signed, and all those people who were stopped at the airport, and it kind of, uh, it, it shook me to my core, and I was thinking about it, and I was on a working visa as well, and uh, I, I felt like I have to tell this story because I knew what those people are going through in the airport at that so, time. So you felt like a target yourself? Yes, I did. I, I, I didn't feel safe anymore too. I, I was like, and I, uh, want, I was looking forward to go visit my parents, but I was very scared and I'm like, I can't go because I'm on working visa. Even though I have a visa, it, you, it, it doesn't matter anymore. People were stopped and sent back these uh, valid green cards. Mm. So, um, and then it was just a point there. I wanted to tell this story, and because uh, people come to this country for economical opportunities, educational opportunities, um, and then there's a certain group who flee the war and uh, the war zone conflict to come to this country, and um, and everyone who are, who is not from this country knows America as a place of freedom where you can express yourself freely and you can start a new life. I can't wait to see Detained. Thank so you. So let's, let's, let's get it funded. Let's get it made. Let's run it through Singular DTV's applications, toke it, and then once you make it, you can come back to EtherVision, which is Singular DTV's distribution portal, and you can put it on your distribution channel and share it with audiences all over the world. Thank you. I can't wait. Yeah. Ushnuda, thank you very much for, thank for you. coming. Thank you for having Joe me. Morton, uh, an honor. Thank you very much for My being pleasure. here. My pleasure. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Great. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. Thank no you so much. No. <laughs> Fantastic. Our mission with these episodes is to showcase dynamic projects that you can fund 
by purchasing tokens through the new Singular DTV Entertainment Economy. Token and Launchpad are live now, and every week from now until the launch of our distribution portal, we'll be selecting projects created in Tokit to fund. So go to Tokit, create your projects, and let's build a decentralized world together. For all of us at Singular DTV, I'm Zach LeBeau. See you around the blockchain.